Talks about talks. There were 17 rounds of them concerning China and Britain's attempts to reach agreement over Hong Kong's political reforms introduced by the governor in 1992. Who headed these gruelling and protracted discussions about the territory's political future for Britain? None other than Sir Robin McLaren, who tonight features in our series, Hong Kong Back and Beyond. Sir Robin was one of the major players on the British team during the joint declaration negotiations. He started his ambassadorship in 1991 and in the middle of the new airport row between China and Britain. His first job was to deliver personally a letter from Prime Minister John Major to Chinese Premier Li Peng about the future of the then controversial project. Ironically, a decade after the joint declaration was signed, Sir Robin found himself again back at the bargaining table with China. There first had to be a negotiation about the basis of the talks because the Chinese wanted at that time uh, agreement on the British side uh, that to their concept of the talks to a precondition which would in effect prejudge the outcome of the talks and just as it was like that in uh, 1982 early 1983 so it was like that in early 1993 uh, th there was much pressure on the Chinese side for uh, us to withdraw the proposals which Mr. Patton had put forward in October uh, 1992 before we got on to having talks about elections but of course we couldn't do that. What followed? 17 rounds of talks. The result? Deadlock with transitional issues mired in politics and more importantly, China promising to dismantle the 1995 elected legislature in 1997 and replacing it with its own council. The prime cause of the difficulties we experienced with all these problems in the JLG, with the airport, with defense lands, with air service agreements and so on, the prime cause was the suspicions raised and heightened by, by Tiananmen. And I think that was the, 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 the real cause of those difficulties. Now certainly the fact that uh, we got in, in, mired in, in, in a, a major dispute about the last elections to be held under British administration, that didn't help any of these other issues either. So they were just aggravated? <coughs> it aggravated the situation, yes. You will remember that we did on the British side make really quite substantial concessions. We made considerable moves away uh, from the governor's original proposals in order to see if we could find some middle ground uh, where the two sides could reach agreement. Now, you know, Hong Kong is really the last jewel in uh, Britain's empire, so to speak. Um, how does it feel being part of the whole process of deciding what Hong Kong's future is going to be. I think that anybody, any British official who's been involved in Hong Kong can take uh, some pride in, in what has been achieved. If you think what Hong Kong was like at the end of the war, um, uh, a, a small, poor place as it emerged from the Japanese occupation, 600,000 people no resources, uh, its infrastructure such as it was destroyed and so on and you look at what it is now now it owes much of that of course most of it to the hard work and enterprise and skill of, uh, of Hong Kong people, of Chinese people of Hong Kong um, and it certainly owes something to good luck uh, to the, to the, to its relation, and to its relationship with the mainland over the years but some of it too uh, is uh, owed to the way in which Britain has administered Hong Kong uh, over the years. And indeed, China has uh, recognized that, at least by implication, in being ready to preserve all those features, the system of justice, the system of the civil service, uh, the financial system, and so on, all those things which we have put in place 
during the period during which Britain has administered Hong Kong and which have helped to make it, make it successful. So I think one can take some pride in that fact. Now there is, of course, one, one thing in which there is a, a sense of regret, but it's, it's only a, pass it's a passing sense of regret. The regret is that, unlike all those other territories which since the war Britain has made independent, Hong Kong cannot be independent, never could be independent. That was always very clear. But had, it be, had history and geography been different, then Hong Kong uh, would have been, no one can doubt it, a most tremendous success as an independent entity. Well, it can't be, but I think that the arrangements which have been put into place do give Hong Kong people the chance uh, to continue to be themselves uh, for at least the next 50 years. I think there are some Chinese officials who believe that uh, Britain would like to see Hong Kong go downhill after the transfer of sovereignty simply as a means of demonstrating that um, Britain is essential. And there are some Chinese officials who like to claim that Britain has left time bombs, as it were, behind in its former dependencies. Um, but there has never been any truth in that. Since retiring in 1994, Sir Robin has been busy writing about Hong Kong's transition. He fondly looks back at his time in Beijing and some of the things that weren't reported. You will notice that David Wilson, when you see the pictures of that, you never see any pictures of David Wilson or, or us. Uh, the re we, we made a tactical mistake there. What well, the point was, if the, the only way you will see us is if you look at the full-scale sort of panoramic photographs where you will see us in the front row. And um, we were the, on, at the end of, of the front row. But of course, when the press did their photographs, they were really only interested in the Prime Minister and, uh, 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 and uh, Zhao Ziyang doing the signatures and so forth. So you see the people in the next row and the upper row. You don't see us at all. We don't appear. You wish that you had stood somewhere? So I rather wish that we had stood in the second row <laughs> rather than in the front row.